thinking about and preparing for fasting this week? Yes or no? Yes? yes. How many of you are really, really... Okay, well, here's the... We're going to be really honest this morning, right? We're not going to be super... We don't want to be like the Pharisees, right? Jesus said really bad things about them, so we're just going to be really honest. How many of you this morning are really... You are so excited that we are beginning our week of fasting and prayer. You're just... You've been looking forward to it. You're just thinking, this is great. <laughs> I saw one hand. <laughs> How many of you, as yesterday came and then this morning, dread filled your heart and you started think about, thinking about how hard it was going to be and how difficult it was going to be? And you, as you thought about it, you got hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. <laughs> Right? Thank you. And, and you thought, let me eat this, this, and this before Sunday comes. <laughs> you feel hungry already. That's right. Me too. As I was preparing this week, and then yesterday as I was uh, beginning to, to, I started earlier in the week, but yesterday as I really began to make, uh, uh, make more serious, have more serious discipline in my life about the food and, and caffeine and things like that, you know, I felt like I was already fasting yesterday. And I got up this morning. Like I said, we're going to be really, really honest. I got up this morning. I was so hungry. <laughs> I thought, I've got to eat. I've got to eat. I've just got to eat. And those of you that know me know that when I get up in the morning, I'm never hungry. I'm never. I, I can happily eat breakfast at 10 or 11 in the morning, and that's fine with me. I can start with a cup of tea and that's fine. I don't have to eat till later. This morning, I thought, I must eat. I'm so, so hungry. So I want to, I want to, what's going on? And um, some of you may have felt the same thing as well. But, um, and I'm not making light, those of you that say, come on, Pastor Jennifer, we should be really serious. This is fasting and prayer. This is part of it. But I do want to be, um, your pastors want to be open and honest with you because we're people too and we all go through the same things. We struggle with the same things and we, we come to the same things and the Word of God is true for everybody and the Spirit of God works with each one of us in the same way whether we are pastors, whether we are lay people, whoever we are. And so we, come to, we want to come to the Word of God this morning. Uh, as I walked in this morning, I did come in early and I wanted to just have some time quietly here in the, in the sanctuary as we get started. Uh, as we were getting started, and uh, Louisa was in the back, and she was um, she was sitting back there, and, and so I said, "Well, Louisa, change the music. I just want to you know, have some prayer time this morning." And uh, so I, I asked her how she was feeling. Sorry, Louisa, I'm just going to share. And she said, "She said not very well. I'm not feeling so well." I said, "I'm not either." And I said, "I don't really want to fast." And she said, "I don't either." <laughs> I said, "But I'm going to." And she said, "I am too." And as we as we started to pray and we prayed uh, we were I was praying for her and I was praying for myself and the Lord just encouraged me you know when we come to a time of fasting and prayer which is what we're doing this week some of us come really with great eagerness and great anticipation many of us do not many of us come with great reluctance uh, some of us come with a lot of questions about fasting, and so I, we're going to talk about some of those things this morning but some of us come to a time of fasting and prayer and we don't feel like fasting and praying at all, do we? We come in, our hearts are cold, uh, there's, no, there's very little emotion, and we feel like, I don't even want to do this. I, I don't even, this is not applicable to me. I'm just not going to because I don't feel anything. And I want to encourage you this morning because the Word of God is true and God always keeps His promises to each one of us. And He says in the Old Testament, to his people that were so far from him, he said, I will give you, for your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh. And sometimes we come to the Lord and we feel like we have hearts of stone, don't we? We don't feel anything. We, we feel like, I, I don't, sometimes we feel like, I don't even feel like I'm, I'm a Christian. And we, we do. We think, I have no feeling. I, I can't hear God. And we have, it just feels like we have hearts of stone. 
But God promises that if we will come to Him, He won't do it against our will, but He will give us hearts of flesh for hearts of stone. And hearts of flesh can feel, and hearts of flesh can respond to the Lord. So I just want to encourage you as we turn to the Word of God this morning and as we talk about fasting and prayer, that God can change your heart. If there is any part of your heart this morning that says, God, I do want you, even if there's part of your heart that's saying, I don't want to do this. This is going to be hard. I, I, fasting is hard for me. I don't know a lot about prayer. I don't pray very much. But if there is part of your heart that says, but God, I want you. God, I want more of you. Then we come to the Lord. I encourage you. I urge you this morning. You just come to the Lord. You come as you are. You don't come all fixed up and say, Okay, Lord, because the Lord already knows our hearts. But we come as we are with our hearts as they are, and we bring them to the Lord. And we say, Lord, here I am. And the Lord promises to meet us where we are when we come to Him honestly. And He will help us do what He's calling us to do. He will help us seek His face. He will help us pray. He will help us fast. And so we look to the word of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. Are you a little bit encouraged already? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. And as I said, I'm going to give some practical examples and some, and some personal experiences this morning. And as I do, I want to encourage you in one area. Some of us, as we look at this this morning, might turn to Matthew chapter 6, which we will look at very shortly. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus does talk about fasting. He's talking to his disciples, and that's part of the Sermon on the Mount, the, the famous Sermon on the Mount. And he says to his disciples, when you fast, do it secretly. Don't tell anybody. Go, in, go, go and do it, and, and on the outside, don't let anybody know. So some of you this morning might be saying, well, Pastor Jen, are you going against the Word of God because you're doing it, you're going to talk about it, you're going to talk about experiences, you're going to, we're, I'm, I'm going to ask you some things as well. I think when we come to Matthew 6, and we'll, we'll look at this shortly, I think we don't usually, we, we, most of the church, I think we haven't really understood what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6 and the heart of what Jesus was talking about because there are other places where there are corporate fasts, which is what we are doing this week. A, a corporate, corporate means body, okay, it has to do with the body, and so it's a body fast. It's the church body as a whole. And there are many other times and many other types of fastings as well when we fast personally and privately. And when we look at, at what the Bible says about fasting, I, I believe the heart of what Jesus was saying was not, keep it a secret and don't let anybody know. I don't think that's what Jesus meant. What Jesus was dealing with was the spiritual pride of the Pharisees who wanted the praise of people when they were fasting, who wanted people to look at them and say, oh, you are so holy. Oh, you are such a good Pharisee. You're so, you're so devout. Because the Pharisees, uh, as when we look at the New Testament, and I told you I was just going to talk this morning, so I am just going to be talking with you. The Pharisees fasted twice a week, good Pharisees. You remember Jesus gave the example of the very holy man that prayed on the corner so everybody could hear him, and he said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that person over there. I fast twice a week. And the Pharisees did. They fasted twice a week, very openly, on Mondays and on what we would call Mondays and Thursdays. And um, in some of the Jewish writings, they, they said it's because on one of the days, uh, Moses went up the mountain to get the law, and on the other day, he came down the mountain with the law. And so we fast on Mondays and Thursdays. But there's a, a better reason for it, probably. In Jerusalem, Mondays and Thursdays were market days. And the market days were, that was when everybody came in from the countryside. That's when Jerusalem was full of people in the markets and in the streets and all. Oh. And so what did the Pharisees do on that day? They messed up their hair. Oh, sorry, got to fix it up again. My hair looks kind of that way anyhow. They messed up their hair. They didn't put oil on their head. Oil was what they would use to groom their hair. Olive oil, they would groom their hair. They would rub ash and they would rub chalk things on their face so that their faces, <laughs> skin looked really white so that they would look like they were really miserable and they would wear old clothes and they'd put ashes on their clothes and they would walk around to show that they were fasting. 
And that's what they did. And that's what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus, I, I believe Jesus was dealing with heart issues in this, in this situation. So when we come to, to this time of corporate fasting and prayer, and when we talk about um, experiences or, or, or things in fasting and prayer, I think when we do it with humility, I believe it honors the Lord. I believe that we can fast, and we, I'm going to encourage you to do this. If you are fasting this week, and, I, and we are going to encourage you to, in whatever way you fast, that you partner with others as you fast, that you pray with others as you, as you fast, that you encourage one another, encourage, encourage each other as you fast, not for pride, but in humility and to strengthen your brothers and your sisters and to honor the Lord. And I believe when our hearts are right and our motives are right, then we can come to a topic like fasting and we can share personal experience. And I think, I, I, for, I know for me, for a long time, when in my earlier Christian life, when I, would fat, when I would have times of fastings, I would try to keep it so, so secret. I wouldn't let anybody know if I had meetings or this or that. And they would, they would, they would say, well, let's eat lunch. And I would say, I would say, um, oh, maybe later, or I would try to keep it so, so secret. And it's okay for it to be private about it. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think we need to live under condemnation of if I fast and somebody finds out I've lost all my reward and I might as well stop fasting. I don't think that's what Jesus was talking about. So we want to talk about fasting this morning. But as we talk about fasting, I first want to talk about food. Okay? <laughs> And some of you say, oh, please, don't talk about food. But I want to talk about food because I want us to be very clear as we come to a time of fasting. Depending on our church backgrounds, um, some of us have questions about fasting. And our feeling, for some, the feeling is that fasting is something that, as Christians living under grace, we shouldn't have to do. We don't do that anymore. Isn't that legalistic? And some of you may feel that. You may feel that's very legalistic. In my church background, I used to. And the church would say, I have to fast at this time, this time, and this time. And I've been set free. So why are we, why are we fasting again? Um, and so I want to talk about food in, that, in this perspective as well. And I want to talk about what the Bible says about food. The Bible says that food, as far as, we, as far as I can find, food has been given to us for four reasons. Okay? And here's the first one. The first one, you may not know this, but the first one, God has given food to us for enjoyment. For enjoyment. It brings pleasure to our lives and it brings enjoyment to our lives. That's in Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25 and Ecclesiastes 5, 18. We're not going to turn there. I'm going to keep on going, but I'm just, just letting you know. The, the Bible, all right, there, there we go. Okay. Um, food uh, food is, a, is a gift from God. It's a pleasure that, that we are given by God. You know, when God made us, when he made man, God did not have to make us as creatures that needed food. He didn't have to. He could have made us in some other way. Aren't you glad that God made you as a being that enjoys food? Yes? Yes. yes. I love food. Sometimes I love it too much, <laughs> as do you. But God gives food for enjoyment. Most of you know I have two cats. You say, oh, Pastor Jen's going to talk about her cats again. Yes, I am. I've had those cats for almost 18 years now. Do you know that I can feed my cats the same thing morning, noon, and night, and they never get tired? <laughs> they never say, change the food. They never walk away in disgust. They never say, I'm tired of this food. Give me tuna instead of salmon. I don't give them salmon, but you know. And they can eat the same thing over and over and over again. That's how God made cats. What about if God, what if God had made you that way? Just one thing would satisfy you. It's okay. I can eat hamburgers. Oh, Lord, would that be awful? <laughs> or the same thing over and over and over again. But God didn't make you that way. God made you with a palate and with taste buds on your tongue 
to enjoy all of these flavors of food. So God has made food for enjoyment, and there's much more there. Secondly, God has made food for sustenance. So not only do we enjoy food, but we need food, don't we? We need food to survive. Even in the Garden of Eden, Adam needed food, and he and Eve ate grains and fruits in the beginning. That's in Genesis 1.30. And then later on, in Genesis 9.3, later on, God also gave animals to, be, to Adam and Eve and said, you may eat these animals uh, for sustenance as well. So number two, we are, food is for sustenance. That's the other reason that God, uh, that God, gave, God gave us food. The third thing we find is that food is for fellowship. And that's in the Bible as well. Food, food is for fellowship. And we find it, the very first instance in the Bible is Genesis, 8, is Genesis 18, 1 through 8. Do you know when that was? Think about that. That was when God came down in human form and he met Abraham, and Abraham didn't know it was God. But Abraham saw him, and what was the first thing he said? Wait, let me prepare a meal for you. I think that's very special, don't you? The, the outside of the Garden of Eden, when God appeared to man, what did, what did Abraham do? What was man's response? What was God's response? movement towards man and what was man's response towards God. It was fellowship through food. How many of you know that in your homes sometimes the only time you get together with family members is at mealtime, right? The rest of the time we're running, rest of the time we're going here. So around food there is fellowship. Now before you think, well, Pastor Jen, you're stretching that just a little bit, I don't believe I am. This is in Genesis 18, 1 through 8, and this is Abraham. Let me prepare some food to refresh you. But when we go a little bit further, we see some other things as well. Um, the Lord's Supper is described as fellowship with the Lord at the Lord's table. In Revelation, this wonderful passage in Revelation 3.20, what does it say in Revelation 3.20? Jesus was talking to people that he wanted to, with whom he wanted to have a relationship. Okay? How does he say it? If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. And it's the idea, now does, it's the idea of the Lord having fellowship with us with a meal. One day in heaven, when Jesus comes again and takes us to be with Him, there will be a meal, a fellowship meal, the marriage supper of the Lamb, one day that's yet to come. And so third, we see that food, God has given food for fellowship. If you have any questions about that, all you have to do is hang around Lighthouse after, after morning service and go upstairs to the fourth floor and you will hear and see and smell and taste so much fellowship <laughs> that you won't know what to do. But something else that we'll see is if you walk outside of this church and if you walk down Nutsford Terrace or some other places, what will you usually see Sundays at lunchtime? You will see Steve Messer and Alistair and others usually at paparazzis <laughs> having fellowship over food and others as well. So God has given food for fellowship. But that's not the only thing God has given food for. Food is also given to us to be a source of worship and thanksgiving. You say worship and thanksgiving? Very, very clearly. In Matthew 6, 11, food is a gift from God. Give us today the food that we need. And then in 1 Timothy 4, we read... Everything that God created is good. We should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. The food is given, and it is given for worship. I want to challenge you in this area, if you haven't or if you don't. The Bible makes it very, very clear, and you can read it throughout the New Testament. If you have not made your meal times a time when you thank God for food, I encourage you to do so. 
I challenge you to do so. I will tell you this, as I have begun to live alone since Sister Betty went back to the U.S., do you know sometimes I'll just get my food because I'm very, it's very casual now. Maybe I'm seat seated on the couch or whatever, and I'll just get something. Maybe I'll even just make popcorn or something like that. And sometimes I'll just sit down and I'll start eating and I'll forget. But I don't want to forget because the Bible makes it very clear food is a gift from the Lord. And so we receive it with thanksgiving. And it's an opportunity to worship and to thank the Lord for what He has given us and everything that He gives us is good. Amen? Amen. So, we've talked about food. Is there a place for fasting in all of this? Yes, there is. And the reason I want to talk, the reason I started off this way is because food is not bad. You will talk with some people and they will say, oh, food is, it's bad. It's bad. That's why I should fast. And our physical, the, our, our physical body, some people will say, it's bad. It's bad. That's why we must fast. That's why I have to punish my body. I want to tell you something this morning. Fasting is not punishing your body. Okay? It's not. But some of us, depending on our church background, have that idea, don't we? Our bodies are bad and we must punish them. No. Our bodies are not bad. God has given us this body. Our bodies are not bad, but our bodies are not to be our boss. Okay? And that's one of the reasons we fast. Food is not bad, but food is not our boss. And how many of you, and I was thinking about this yesterday, I was preparing, how many of you would acknowledge that there are times in your life when food is your boss? Thank you. I feel the same way. I must eat. I want to eat. Everything revol revol revolves around eating. And, and sometimes all I do is think about food. Yes? I, I talk about food. All of these things. Food is not bad. It's given by God, we saw, for these four reasons. But it must not be our boss. Our bodies, God has given us to live in this world. Our bodies, the physical part, it's not bad. But it's not to be our boss. How many of you know that there are times when our physical desires, our physical needs in many ways, they really, they rule us, don't, don't they? We're sleepy. I want to sleep. I want to sleep. We're hungry. I want, to, I want to eat. I want this or I want that. And as we see when we look at the Bible, as we look at some of these scriptures, we're going to see that one of the things that fasting does is it puts things in our lives in the proper place. Things that have become our boss over time get dethroned when we fast. Food doesn't rule me. If I, have, if I have been fasting in the right way. My physical body and my needs stop ruling me and stop dictating when I'm fasting with the right motives and in the right way. And that's one, as we're going to see in a minute, that's one of the benefits of fasting. It's not the primary thing, but it's one of the benefits. And it, and it is one of the things that we, when we fast, these things get taken care of. Those of you you will find as you enter into fasting, if you have not before, you can talk to anybody who has fasted, um, who has fasted and has made fasting a part of their lives. You will find that when you come to the end of your fast, even though you will be hungry and even though you'll be really happy to eat that meal and to eat that good food, you will find that you will have better control over your appetite at the end of the fast, rather than, I must eat, I must eat, I must eat. It will be, no, that comes under the control of the spiritual man. And that's one of the great benefits of fasting. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, as we think about fasting, some of us have questions, right? Some of you are worried, if I fast, won't I get sick? You're not worried about that. That's okay. Some people are. Some of you are worried, if I fast, um, won't I harm my body? Some of you may be thinking, isn't fasting just very, very legalistic? Some of you have questions about, how long should I fast? Some of you have questions about, um, if I fast, God, will God answer my prayer for sure? If I fast, um, God will, do, will answer my prayer and He will do what I want Him to do, right? Wrong. 
and we'll talk about that. But we have questions about fasting, so let's look at the Bible for some things about fasting. And I want to, let's stay with the Old Testament uh, first, and I want to just get some re response from you. You know your Bibles, and I want you to think with me for just a minute, not the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. Who are some people and what are some situations that you can think of where fasting was in, uh, fasting was was part of the occasion in the Old Testament? Any anybody? Raise your hand, wave it, and then I'll. Okay. Daniel. Daniel. Okay. Daniel actually on on one time or more than one time. More than one time, okay? At least twice, and some people would say three times, and we'll talk about that. So Daniel, and Daniel is the one that we look at the most. So definitely, Daniel in the Old Testament. Somebody else? Ezra. Okay, Ezra, when? Uh, before he went. Before he went. They were going back to Jerusalem, and they were carrying great amounts of gold, and he was worried because there were bandits on the road, and he was ashamed to ask the king for protection because he said, we believe in God. And so they fasted and prayed before they went on the trip. Okay, what, what else? Okay, Esther is another one. And we'll look at that just a little bit later. And for Esther, uh, a little bit unusual. Esther, when she fasted, it was an, ab I call it an absolute fast. Different people call it different things, but an absolute fast for three days when there was the possibility that all of the Jews would be destroyed. Um, and so she, she and those with her said, you fast and pray for three days without food, without water. Okay, so without food and without water. Um, I'm looking at the time, and we still have plenty of time, but as we're going along, let me go ahead and talk about some things because we'll talk about types of fast. Have any of you ever taken part in an absolute fast? No food, no water. Okay, one or two of us have. This is one of the things that we see in the Bible. This is not the only time there's been an absolute fast in the Bible. Can you think of one other person? that had an absolute fast, no food, no water. Moses, when he went up, but very special circumstances, right? How many days? 40 days and 40 nights. And if it were not special circumstances, we wouldn't have been reading about Moses after that. He would have been dead. But he was in the presence of the Lord on Mount Sinai for 40 days and for 40 nights. And, a, and as far as we know, that happened, then that, was, that happened again as well. Without food and water. A supernatural situation. So in that situation, let me set, let me set that one aside. But Esther was an absolute fast. What I would say is this. This morning, as a church, we're calling to corporate fast. But I believe for an absolute fast, um, I think that I do believe there's a place for absolute fasting. But I also believe that if you, if you take an absolute fast, it should only be when the Holy Spirit has very strongly prompted you and led you to an absolute fast. Because it's extremely difficult and it can be dangerous for your body and it should never be more than three days. Never, never, never more than three days. And it's usually, if you do that, some, some people I know may have done it for a day or something like that. I, I believe those are very, very special circumstances um, when you're called to an absolute fast. In, in my life, only once have I had an, had, did I undertake an absolute fast, and that was many years ago when I was in China, and it was before uh, June 4th, 1989. And I didn't know, but the Holy Spirit knew, I didn't know what was coming up, but it was in the early days of May when the Holy Spirit led me to fast for three days as an absolute fast. And because He led me to, I did, but I would never do it under other, under other circumstances. And He knew what was ahead with what was coming up with the students and with the government. I didn't, but he'd led me to, to, to fast at that time. And I didn't tell anybody, but after I stopped, I, after, after I finished, the Holy Spirit prompted Betty to do the same thing for three days after that. And I didn't, she didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't know what she was doing until later. So I do believe there's a place for it, but you have to be very, very clear that the Lord is calling you to that. To do that, so there is an absolute fast. So we see that with Esther. Can you think of any other any other Old Testament ones? People in Nineveh. Okay, the people in Nineveh. 
Um, wicked, ungodly people, when they heard that God's judgment was upon them, they proclaimed and they called a fast. Okay? And it was no water and it was no food. And here's the only occasion when the animals didn't get it either. Very, very unusual. And the, children. and the children. That's the only place in the Bible you see a very special situation. Even the children fasted. Um, it is not in the Bible. But generally, parents, those of you that have children, you can talk with your children about fasting. But generally speaking, children should not fast. And young people generally should not fast because of the growing need, their growing bodies and things like that. But are, can they do something in the spirit of fasting? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Your kids that love all of those electronic devices. Mmm, that could be a fast, couldn't it, for, for children. I believe, and I told, I, as I said, I told you I would just be talking as we look at, at Scripture. I believe there is a place, I believe there is a way that Everybody can fast. I really do. Even those of us, some of you have medical conditions, and, um, and as we said, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, if you have diabetes, if you're pregnant, uh, if you have a low blood sugar, you have to be really careful about fasting. You'll have to do something. You have to do something a little bit different. Um, if you have, if you have had problems, if you had eating disorders before, you have to be really careful about fasting. But I believe when we look at the heart of fasting, I believe there's a place for everybody to fast. Um, I spoke with a friend in the States who just finished fasting this last week and she's under fairly heavy medication. Um, and she said, I fasted, but she said I had to do it differently because I had to take medication with food. So I just changed my diet for the week. And for the week I ate very simply. I, I, I didn't have snacks and this and that. I just ate simple foods. And some people would say, oh, that's like a Daniel fast, right? And, we'll talk, and we can talk about that. So we said a Daniel fast as well. Daniel never called it a Daniel fast in the beginning. He never called it a fast. And he never said, now, this is a special type of fasting. Um, but Daniel said, I ate no pleasant foods, I ate no meat, and I ate no, no other foods that really br brought pleasure to me. And many people, when they come to fasting, there's a lot of, of, uh, of uh, talk about this. They say, well, I'm going to do a Daniel fast. I want to encourage you. The da a Daniel fast, if people call it that, the Bible doesn't. The, a Daniel fast is when you limit your, your, your fluids to water, usually water only, so you wouldn't do coffee or tea, um, water only, and you usually just have vegetables, okay? Just vegetables. You wouldn't have milk products. You wouldn't have meat products, cheeses, or things like that. It would just, you just have water and simple veg vegetables. Um, and even if you're preparing the vegetables, you just keep them really simple. Um, I, when I was preparing last year, I, I, I was talking with Julie about it, and I just had to laugh. Uh, I, there were all these websites for Daniel Fasts. And if you go online, you can find all sorts of stuff. And one of the uh, proclamations on this one site online was Daniel Fast Recipes. <laughs> and, and Daniel Fast, it's a Daniel Fast cookbook. Okay, now if some of you have a Daniel Fast cookbook on your, on your, on your bookshelf at home, please don't be offended at me right now. But the spirit of it was you can make food, you can use these recipes and you won't be hungry at all during your fast. You won't suffer anything. You won't even know you're fasting with this Daniel Fast diet and with this Daniel Fast cookbook. Do you know what I think? If you're going to do that, you might as well just eat. Okay? Because fasting, whatever it is, whether you call it a Daniel Fast, an absolute fast, or a regular fast, whatever it is, fasting is saying to your body and to your stomach that always wants to be boss and feed me and feed me now, what it is saying in part is you're not going to be the boss of me. My spirit man is going to rule my life. God is going to have control of my life, not this physical body which God has given me for this world, but it's the physical part is for this, this life only. Instead, God, you're going to be strong in my life, not me and not my flesh. And so if, you're, if you've been thinking, well, I'll do a Daniel fast and then it'll be easy, um, go to the Lord and say, Lord, I think my motives are wrong. 
and ask the Lord to purify your heart and ask the Lord to purify your motives, okay? Now, am I being too legalistic for you right now? I don't think so. But at, come to the Lord because we can, in fasting, it's very easy to have mixed motives. I want this and I want that. But I promise you, if you will come to the Lord very honestly and in humility and just say, God, I want to, I want to honor you in this fast. I want to do it and I want to do it right. Please help me. Search my heart. I promise you, the Lord will search your heart. He will show you where your thinking is wrong. He will show you where, ah, you, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Do it for the right reasons. God will purify your heart as you fast, as He has purified mine. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's keep on going. So, uh, is there any other, can you think of anything else in the Old Testament for fasting? Were there, sorry? David. Okay, David fasted several times. David fasted when Saul was killed. David fasted and mourned because fasting when, when his son was sick and he didn't want his son to die. He fasted and he pleaded with God. And also when Abner, one of the others, when Abner died, David fasted then. And in Psalms, David also says, I humbled myself, I humble myself with fasting. David writes that in the psalm. So David was, uh, was fasted as well. There's another one as well. And there is one, I I'll go ahead and tell you right th this right now. In the New Testament, there is no command to fast. So some of you might say, yay, no fasting for me. Mm. <laughs> we'll get to that. In the Old Testament, there is one command to fast. And it was on the Day of Atonement. Okay, it was the Day of Atonement. Uh, let's see if I've got a scripture reference for that. I don't think I've got a scri scripture. I can tell you later if you want to find it. On the Day of Atonement, one day a year, they, the whole nation was to fast uh, from sundown to the following, the following evening to the following sundown. That's only in the Old Testament. Okay, so here we have Old Testament examples. What about us? Some of you right now might be thinking, yeah, but Pastor Jen, that's Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm a New Testament believer. No fasting for me, right? Well, can you think of some times in the New Testament when there was fasting? The longest one, first of all. Who? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Jesus, our best example. Our best example. And Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is in Luke 3 and Luke 4. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then it says, right after that, he went out into the desert and he fasted. Those of us that know, that, that know our Bibles fairly well, why did Jesus, who led Jesus into the wilderness to fast? Ah, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to fast. Now, what does the Bible say about that type of fast? Did Jesus eat during that time? No. How long was it? Forty days. Forty days. Did Jesus drink during that time? No. We don't know, but I, I think He did. And the reason I think He did is because of what the Bible says. The Bible says He fasted for forty days, and after that, after forty days, what does it say? He was what? He was hungry. He was hungry. So Jesus was hungry at the end of the time, the Bible says, but it doesn't say anything about thirst. Personally, I think Jesus drank during that time. That's, that's me. But I'm not going to fight you about that. And don't come to me afterwards and say, but Pastor Jen, I'm not going to argue with you either. Because I'm beginning my, day, my week of fasting and prayer, and I'm going to keep my heart nice <laughs> and happy. So I'm not going to argue with you. I think he drank, but he did not eat. And the Bible is very clear about that. And it encourages me because Jesus did that. Let me, tell you, let me tell you why, one other reason why I believe he drank. The Bible makes it very clear. It uses his name, Jesus, which was the earthly name. It had to do with Jesus. It had to do with the man, Jesus. The man, Jesus. Not the Son of God in that way. The man. And Jesus, if Jesus had fasted, and resisted the temptation of the enemy with God's help in a special way, 
supernaturally being without water for 40 days, that is something that you and I cannot do. We can't. We're human. You can't go 40 days. You, six days and you and I are gone. Probably less than that. It's true. It's true. And so to me, when we look at the example of Jesus going into the wilderness and fasting for 40 days, He did it as a man. And that's why I believe He drank. I believe He drank water. Because He did it, He went through what you and I go through. He faced the temptations that you and I faced. And He overcame because why? He depended on God. He depended on God. And so, to me, when I look at that, I believe He drank. And most people would call that, most of the time when we look at that, we would call that, the Bible doesn't give special names to fasts. We sometimes do. For me, I would call that a regular fast. And to me, I think that's the most common type of fasting in the Bible. And the most common type of fast, it's not really the Daniel fast, and it's not the Esther fast either. The most common type of fasting is to abstain from food, uh, to abstain from food, but to drink water. That's the most common type of fast in the Bible. And there may be some of you, so I want to ask you this morning, as you've been seeking the Lord and waiting on the Lord, how many of you this morning feel like the Lord is probably leading you to do a regular fast. So you're going to, you're not going to eat food, but you're going to drink water only for a certain amount of time, short or long. I'm not asking about length, but how you're going to do it. Do some of you feel that? Would you just, do you mind, you don't have to raise your hands, but you can. Anybody? Okay. So a few of us. For me, I feel like that's what the Lord, at least for part of the time, is leading me to do. Just a regular fast. So uh, a fast with water. Okay. Um, and I believe that's what Jesus. I, I believe that's what Jesus did. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I think the Holy Spirit told me to do it that way. And so we come to it that way. So we see that in the New Testament. But I want to ask you something else now. So we look at Jesus, but we say, but that was while Jesus was still on the earth. Are there any other types of fasting after Jesus went back to heaven? Can you think of some other? Because if the early church did it, then it's a good pattern for us. If the early church did not fast, then I would say, mm, okay, maybe no fasting for us. Did the early church fast? Did people in the church fast? Can you think of some? Marianne is going, yes, yes, yes. Who, Marianne? I think they were not when they were praying and waiting for the Okay. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but most people believe that when the disciples were in the upper room praying for the first for the fullness of the Holy Spirit that they were fasting and there are, things, there are reasons that people believe that and I tend to think that as well. Can you think of some other circumstances? Okay, thank you. What's in Acts 13, Pastor Renee? Calling upon and Barnabas. Oh, okay. Let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, and uh, Acts 13 and then, and then we'll come Acts 13. Let's look at that. Acts 13, 1 through 3. And here we see some of the benefits as well. We're going to skip ahead, skip past Matthew, and Klein, and go to Acts 13, 1 through 3. And what do we see here? This is at the church in Antioch, okay? Here are all these people. Barnabas was there, remember? Good old Barnabas, right? And who else is there? Saul is there. And then what does it say? One day as these men were what? Worshiping the Lord and fasting. And actually... When it says worshiping the Lord and fasting, the idea is fasting was part of worship. They, they were, their fasting was a worship to the Lord. That's the, that's the idea, idea there. The Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So when we look at this passage, we see, all right. So those of us that were saying, hmm, it's an Old Testament practice and not for New Testament Christians, this verse knocks it out from under our feet, right? So we see fasting in the New Testament, and it's a circumstance. What are the circumstances here? Let's look at it. And here's one of the benefits of fasting. One of the benefits of fasting, and sometimes one of the reasons we fast, we, we fast to draw close to the Lord, but something that will result if that is one of your goals and if you're seeking the Lord for, for it, it is this. Fasting will reveal and clarify God's call 
upon your life. Okay? Fasting will reveal and clarify God's calling upon your life. God has, God has something for you to do. God has things He wants to do through you in this upcoming year. There are, there are, there are, uh, there are things that God has in store. And as you wait on the Lord and as you fast, those things will become clear to you. Those things will be revealed in fasting. Every time? Not every time. But that is one of the patterns that we see. So I want to encourage you, if you have a stirring in your heart and you feel like, I think God is calling me to something, but it's not clear and I don't know, then I urge you, take time this week to wait upon the Lord in worshiping and fasting and wait for the Holy Spirit to reveal and clarify God's will for your life. Now, I want you to notice something else here, which to me is really interesting. They're worshiping the Lord and they're fasting. The Holy Spirit then reveals something to them. And I want you to see what happens next. Do Barnabas and Saul jump up and run off to do the work that they have planned? No. What does the Bible say? Ah, more fasting. So after <coughs> more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So here we see one of the other benefits of fasting and one of the goals in fasting as well. Here they have been called by the Lord to do something and then with more fasting and prayer, they go on their way for the special work. In my life, one of the the times when I have purposed it for me in my heart outside of corporate times, this is for personal fasting, when I know I have a special work ahead, those are times when I try to set aside time for fasting and prayer. Um, you know that Pastor Renee and I will often, maybe we are called to speak somewhere or we go on missions trips at times or we speak at the international student gatherings in China or at Tagai Thai or at other places like that. For me, not legalism and not boasting, but for me, I, I need to fast. And so when I tell you that, it's not, oh, Pastor Jen, I'm telling you, I need to. Do you know why I need to? Because my mind is so strong and my will is so strong and I can be so self-sufficient because I have all these Bible programs and I know how to study and I'm a pretty good scholar and I can study and I can do this and I can make a great message and I can do all of this. And because I recognize that about myself, I know that that part of me can't do anything good for anybody because it's earthly and it's human. And so what I do because I need to, I fast. I fast. And when I fast, that part of me is humbled. That part of me, instead of being built up, is broken down. That part of me, instead of getting bigger and higher and stronger and prouder, gets softer and weaker and it moves to the background and the Spirit of God in me is given more room and more place so that when I do what God has called me to do, it's not me, it is not I, but it is God. It is not I, but it is God. And I just told you all of that not to say, not for you to say, wow, Pastor Jen does that. I told it to you very clearly. So now you know, huh, Pastor Jennifer struggles with these things, so she needs to fast. And that's how you can think of it. And I want to encourage you because God has called you as well to do things. God has things that He wants you to do. And if you want to do them in the power of God and not in your own power, in the wisdom of God and not in your own wisdom, in the strength of God and not in your own strength, in humility rather than in pride, there is a place for fasting in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen? That was a little weak, but it's true. It's true, and that's one of, the, that's one of the, the benefits that we see. Another thing that we see in the New Testament um, is Acts, uh, Acts 14, 21 through 23. And by the way, when we look at fasting in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I'm saying fasting, but you know what the Bible always says? Always? 
The Bible says fasting and prayer always. If you fast, if all you do is, I'm not going to eat, you might as well call it a diet, okay? Because really that's primarily what it is. But in the Bible, fasting and prayer always go together. They always go together. What do we see here? Paul and Barnabas again, they had been sent out. And I want you to see something here. This, and, and I want to encourage you because um, as we look at this, some of us are going to think, okay, tick it off my list. I have fasted for, 2000 and, for 2014. I've done my duty. I've done it. This week, okay, I have fasted, ready to keep on going. I don't think that's the way the Bible presents fasting. Because when we look at this, we see Barnabas and Paul who fasted and were called, who fasted and then were equipped and were sent out, and then as they are on their journey, what do they see? They develop, they, they build churches, they, they, people come to the Lord, they set up churches, and then they have to make some very, very important decisions, right? To choose who's going to be the elder of a church, to choose who's going to lead the church is a really, really serious thing that's going to affect many people's lives. How do Paul and Barnabas do it? How do they do it? Okay. They appointed elders in the church with prayer and fasting. They turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So they trusted in the Lord and they appointed elders. So I want to encourage you, if you are facing difficult, important decisions in your life, God, what should I do about this? I tell you right now, fasting has a place for you. There's a place for fasting in your life if you are facing difficult decisions. There's a place for fasting for you. And you say, well, what does it do? And, I, and I'm, uh, I'm watching the time and it's, I'll tell you what, when we come back this afternoon, if you have some questions and whatever, I can finish up with a little bit more this afternoon. Um, but what does fasting do? Does fasting, as we look at this, does fasting change God's mind? Does fasting change God's heart? We're going to fast. If, if I fast enough, then God will change his mind about me and what I want to do. Is that what fasting does? Absolutely not. Fasting doesn't change God. Fasting changes me. <laughs> Might as well say, fasting changes me. And we see this, we see, we see this in all of these examples. It doesn't change God, it changes me. It changes my heart. And so if you're coming to a place of an important decision, you've got something to decide. God, what should I do about this? I really don't know. I could do this or I could do that. And it is a serious decision and it's going to affect a lot of uh, your family, your future. I encourage you to get serious with the Lord about fasting. And you can do it this week. You can do it this week. Finally, this morning, um, can you think, uh, we thought of, I know there were a few other, there's, there's some other examples in the New Testament. Let me just mention this. Uh, Matthew 6, 16. Matthew 6, 16. And 17. Okay, this where I'm backing up. See, I didn't give you 58 pages of notes. I, I didn't even give you eight pages of sermon. I, I gave you about three pages of it. Um, Matthew 6, 16, 16 and 17. Jesus says, when you fast, don't make it obvious, but we're fasting corporally. So by the way, if you look kind of weak and wimpy this week, we're all fasting, okay? So don't worry about it. You're not trying to be a Pharisee or a hypocrite. But Jesus said, when you fast. So Jesus was assuming his disciples would fast, that they would fast. And shortly after this, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And at one point, a man, and we come to a close this morning, a man, a father, came to Jesus in great distress. And this is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's found in all three of the Gospels. And you say, where? Look it up on your own, in your Bible. It's in all three Gospels. A man, a father, came in great distress. He said, Jesus, please, can you heal my boy? 
He said since early childhood, in one of the Gospels it says he has epilepsy and he often falls into the fire or into the water and he almost burns or drowns. In one of the other Gospels it says a demon spirit afflicts him and he falls over. And so we see both of those and he says, I took him to, I brought him to your disciples and your disciples could not heal him. What does Jesus say? in that situation. And this has to do with fasting as we come to a conclusion this morning. He said, can you, can you heal my boy? And Jesus, with a word, with a word, heals the boy. And the boy is set free. A little boy who was in bondage through no fault of his own. Things happen through no fault of his own. Sometimes things happen to us or our family members, and it's our fault, isn't it? We brought it on ourselves. We, we kept on going down that road until we got addicted. We kept on choosing that until, until we were in bondage to that. Sometimes we bring things on ourselves, and sometimes things just happen because we live in a broken and a fallen and a sinful world. But Jesus set him free. And the man went away, took his son away with great joy. Imagine that, that the torment and the bondage of that boy for all of those years. The Bible doesn't tell us how old he was when Jesus healed him, but it obviously had been for a while since from, from, a, from a small child, the devil had been afflicting him with this. And after they've gone away, the disciples come and they're kind of embarrassed and ashamed, aren't they? We would be too, right? Because how would you feel if somebody came to you and said, please pray for this, and you pray, in the name of Jesus I command, and nothing happens. That's what happened to the disciples. Nothing happened. Nothing. Nothing. And so he comes, and then Jesus heals, and the disciples come to him, and they say, Master, why couldn't we do that? And that was a legitimate question. Do you know why it was a legitimate question? Jesus had already given his disciples authority over evil spirits and to proclaim the gospel. He had already said, I give you authority. So what happened in that particular situation? You know what Jesus said to them? Jesus said, it's because your faith is so small. Fasting increases faith. Fasting increases faith. The Bible is very, very clear about that. And everybody, anybody who has ever fasted unto the Lord would tell you the same thing. And, but Jesus didn't stop there. He said, because your faith was so small. He says, you really didn't believe. And then he says at the end of that, he says what? He says, this type of situation, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, in this type of situation, it's, this type doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting by prayer and fasting. Some manuscripts include that, that phrase and some don't. But he says this type doesn't come out by prayer and fasting. And what did Jesus mean that is applicable for you and for me today as we come into this time of fasting? There are circumstances and situations in your life that are of the devil where you have been in bondage or where there, ha where there has been a brokenness or where there is a stronghold and you've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and you've asked, oh God, please, oh God, please, oh God, please, and it just seems that nothing has happened and nothing has moved. I urge you, if you're serious about it, take it to God with fasting and prayer. Take it to God with fasting and prayer and see what He will do. See what He will do. I have a very good friend. You say, but what about other details? You can find the details outside on the desk outside. If you're going to join us this afternoon, wait until this afternoon. Details about how to fast, whether you're going to fast one meal a day, that's okay. Some of you have to work. You can fast one meal a day. Or you say, well, I'm going to try tomorrow. Or I'm going to try today because I don't have to work. And then maybe one meal a day. Talk to the Lord about it. God's not legalistic, and we're not either. 
but I close with this. And so get this. And if you're coming back this afternoon, wait and we'll give it to you this afternoon. It's a prayer guide and a fasting guide. Some of you have already see, received this before. In 2009, 2010, we used this as well. I have a very good friend who was a spirit-filled Christian. She loved God. She was a good mother. And she went to visit her son, who was in his early 20s. He lived in another city. And when she he'd been, hadn't been there that long, she was a spirit, it was a good family, she was a spirit-filled family. And when she went to visit her son in this other city, she found out to her horror and to her shock that her son was in a homosexual relationship. It broke her heart. And she and her husband dragged him off from his apartment, from the city where he, he was, and dragged him back home and said, you cannot do that. That is wrong. That's an abomination. You cannot. And basically kept him locked up in their home for a while to keep him from going back. And he was there for about a month. And then he said, well, I want to go out and whatever. And so they thought, OK, well, you can go. And, and the whole time he was home, she was talking with him. And she was telling him, the Bible says this, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. And he went out and he disappeared. And she found out that he had returned to that city and he had continued with his partner in this homosexual lifestyle. And she and her husband were frantic and they were desperate. And she, she, she said, what, what can we do? What can we do? And those of you that know anything about this, this type of lifestyle and this, this type of sin, it, it's a bondage. It's very, very hard to break free and to break out. And she said, well, he's too old. We can't tie him up. We can't make him whatever. He, he's an adult. You know what she did? Every day for a year, for a year, she fasted lunch and prayed. Fasted and prayed for, it was an hour or more, every single day for a year. She couldn't change him and she couldn't change the situation. And so she directed her attention to God. And every day, lunchtime, no food. While the rest of the, she'd prepare food for the family, she would go up to the bedroom, she would get on her knees for an hour every day at lunchtime and call on the Lord and ask for mercy and say, oh God, deliver my son. One year later, knock on the door. It was her son. And God had set him free. And he said, Mom, I'm home. Can I come back? And she said, yes. Prayer and fasting can change impossible situations. This morning as we close, you just go ahead and close your eyes and let's just, just close this. And I know I've gone a little bit, I know I've gone longer today 